Everybody, you can go ahead and have a seat. Drew's going to read our, read our scripture for us. Well, to belabor the point, good morning to all of you. Uh, the scripture reading this morning is from 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, it's the whole chapter. So please read along with me and let's hear the word of the Lord together. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, would that my Lord were the, with the prophet who was in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord. Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of Yahweh his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farper, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, my father, it is a great word that the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do what he says? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so accept now a present from your servant. But he said, As Yahweh lives, before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth. For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any god but Yahweh. In this matter, may Yahweh pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Ramon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Ramon. When I bow myself in the house of Ramon, Yahweh, pardon your servant in this matter. He said to him, go in peace. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, See, my master has spared this Naaman the Syrian in not accepting from his hand what he brought. As Yahweh lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi followed Naaman. And when Naaman saw someone running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? He said, all is well. 
my master has sent me to say, there have just now come to me from the hill country of Ephraim, two young men of the sons of the prophets. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. And Naaman said, be pleased to accept two talents. And he urged him and tied up two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothing and laid them on two of his servants. And they carried them before Gehazi. And when he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and put them in the house. And he sent the men away, and they departed. He went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant went nowhere. But he said to him, Did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male servants and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, a leper like snow. Thanks, Drew. Love the story. Uh, my name's Ben. I'm the associate pastor here, and it's just a privilege to be in the Word with you all this morning. So uh, we're powerless to both speak God's Word or to hear God's Word. We need His Spirit, so let's pray together. Heavenly Father, my prayer is that you would give your servants understanding according to your word. That we would be informed, but not just informed, transformed uh, from one degree of glory to the next. I pray that those in the room who don't know Jesus would hear the gospel and respond this morning. Those of us who do know him would be encouraged pressed on to love and good deeds. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I love a good story. Uh, anything that has a, like a twist in it is especially a favorite of mine. Um, something, an event that happens that changes the way you look at the whole story. I'm thinking of Probably the most famous one would be Star Wars, Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, when Darth Vader says, I'm your father. And it's just like, oh my, the whole story changes. It's all different than we thought it was. It's not just good versus evil. It's not just Luke Skywalker versus Darth Vader. It's father, son. It's, it's intimate. It's betrayal. It's, it's family. For you younger folks, I'm thinking... Uh, Harry Potter, the third book, Prisoner of Azkaban, when Harry is fleeing from this dangerous Sirius Black, the escaped prisoner, the whole book. And then at the end, we realize that Sirius Black is actually his godfather. He was framed for murder, and he's been protecting Harry the whole time. Changes the way that we look at the whole story. And uh, this story here in, in 2 Kings chapter 5 is is actually one of those stories. It has, a, it has a big twist. We have this problem that we're trying to solve the whole story, but then there comes a point where we realize the problem's different than, than we thought it was, and it changes the way we look at the whole story. And, and I think maybe the key to noticing what the real problem is, where the twist is, is noticing the servants in this story. So I think the main point that we're getting at here is this. The main point of our story, God is purifying his servants. God is purifying his servants. So our, our basic layout today is I'm going to tell the story. Uh, that'll take a majority of our time. I'm just going to work through the story, pointing out details that I think are really relevant to the point that the story is making. And then at the end, I'll, I'll make three statements, kind of three application points about God's purifying work that we must believe and obey in order to ourselves be faithful servants, in order to respond to this story how we're supposed to. So, tell the story, 
three points. Don't be scared when we're half an hour in and I haven't gotten any points yet. That's, that's normal. That's uh, how I practiced it. So uh, let's jump in. Before we actually start reading, I'll, kind of, I'll read through the whole story as we go here. But before we start reading, I think there's two realities you need to understand in order to understand this story. Two realities. So number one is leprosy. You'll notice that one of the main characters is a leper. The story starts with leprosy and ends with leprosy. So what is leprosy? It's, it's this broad term in the Old Testament, Old Testament times for a, a whole variety of different skin diseases that make somebody uh, kind of, it's kind of like dry rot on your skin. And so your fingers fall off and then your hands and feet and eventually you die. It's not a good thing. It was much feared in the ancient world, and more significantly, in the religious system that God set up in the first five books of the Bible, the the Pentateuch, the Torah, uh, leprosy made you ritually impure. It made you unclean so that you couldn't participate in the religious life of your your tribe and of your country. So it was a a distancing factor, not just physically, but socially and, and religiously as well. So there's leprosy. Second would be the idea of national deities. National deities, that is, gods that control countries. So back in the day, there wasn't a separation between churches and states. Uh, rather, religion and government were, were well tied together. And so every country, more or less, had a god or gods that they served and worshipped. And that god either did well for them or didn't do well for them. So behind national conflicts was actually religious conflicts, spiritual conflicts. So, so if one nation is getting stomped by another nation in war, what do you think that means about their gods? Well, the, the one god is, is stomping the other god in the heavens. And that dynamic is going to come into play really significantly in this story. So the god of Israel, the national of Israel is, is Yahweh, the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And then we learned that the national deity of Syria is this god called Ramon. And uh, when I preached this to the leadership class last week, they all asked, what do we know about Ramon? And I looked. We don't know anything about Ramon. This is like the only place in the Old Testament that he shows up. So all you need to know, he's the national deity of, of Syria. He's, he's connected with them. All right. Those are the two realities, leprosy, national deities, that we need to know to understand the story. So let's jump in. Chapter 5, verse 1. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria. All right, stop there. Didn't get very far. Naaman is the commander of the army of the king of Syria. Syria is to the north of Israel. So so they're bordered against the northern kingdom uh, called Israel as opposed to Judah. And they've been kind of breathing down Israel's necks for a long time. And so obviously there's a conflict between Syria's God and and Israel's God, and Naaman is kind of this figurehead of this opposing army. So when a Jew, an Israelite reads this, they think, boo, bad news. We don't like, we don't like Naaman, the commander of the army of Syria. Public enemy number two. Get rid of Naaman. But then the narrator goes on to describe him with these really positive terms. He was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor. So we find out that Naaman is a great dude. You, you want Naaman on your team. He's a faithful servant. Notice servant. He's a faithful servant to the, to the king of Syria, but he's also been kind of ignorantly, kind of unknowingly a servant of the Lord. Do you notice that? By him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor. And then our narrator sets up the main problem of the story. But he was a leper. Great guy, but he's a leper. And these two things are in conflict because leprosy separates you from your community and it eventually kills you. You cannot be great and be a leper. So either Naaman needs to find a solution to his leprosy or he will cease to be great. And and then we should notice that from the eyes of an Israelite, which we should try to read the Hebrew scriptures with the eyes of an Israelite, from the eyes of an Israelite, Naaman is like doubly distant from God. He's like as far away from God as you can get because he's, an, he's a commander of an army that's attacking God's people and he's a leper. Even if somehow he became an Israelite, he'd still be distanced from God because of 
his leprosy. So bad news, Naaman's in a bad, bad spot, even though he's a good guy. So what are we going to do about it? Now, the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. And she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, this innocent little girl, just kind of thinking out loud, she says, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who's in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. This little girl is just thinking, man, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be great if, if Naaman was, was in my home country? There's a prophet there who could, who could help him out. So here we have this little, little servant girl just being kind of a mouthpiece for the Lord. Uh, maybe you should go and talk to the, to the prophet who's in Samaria. And we might expect Naaman to kind of brush this off. You know, he's this great commander, and here's this little girl that he carried off as the spoils of war, giving him a suggestion about how he should deal with his leprosy problem. But, but Naaman's not like that. He's, he's desperate, and he's humble. And so he, he takes what the girl says, and like any good servant, he goes to his master. Naaman went in and told his lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. Told, her the, told him the solution to the problem. And the king of Syria said, go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So it seems like it's going to be a short story, right? Naaman's a leper, but he's going to go get cured by the prophet who's in Israel. So he went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 changes of clothing. One person that I listened to on this said, all you need to know is that's a truckload of cash. And he's right. I mean, that's like, he's got this caravan, donkeys and donkeys, filled with gold and silver and, and clothes. And he has this official letter from the king of Syria. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. But then, just like any good story, opposition arises to our solution. It's never that easy, right? This time the opposition comes from outside. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he's seeking a quarrel with me. The king of Israel at the time, his name's Jehoram, and uh, he's, kind of, he's kind of a lame king in, in most senses. His dad, King Ahab, you guys might recognize that name, King Ahab is the one who married Jezebel and, and just wholesale carried the country into rampant, pervasive idolatry to the Baals and the Ashtaroth, which Jezebel worshipped. And just blew up the northern kingdom of Israel, spiritually speaking. And his son, Jehoram, uh, didn't really make the situation worse. But he also didn't do anything to make the situation better. He just, he just kind of rode the coattails of his dad. He's kind of, he's kind of a lame duck king. He just, he just doesn't do much. And, and here we see how how absolutely ignorant he is of the things he really should know. I mean, as the king of Israel, he should be familiar with what the God of Israel is doing in his country. But when this letter comes, cure this man of his leprosy, Elisha, the great prophet who's been doing many miracles in the midst of his domain, Elisha doesn't even come to his mind. And so he, he thinks, the king of Syria is trying to trap me. If I send this guy back, it means war. If I try to cure him and I can't, it means war. Rock in a hard place, tears his clothes, he's trying to pick a fight with me. He has no idea what God's doing in his time and in his country. He doesn't even think of Elisha. But Elisha gets wind of what happened. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes... He sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may know there is a prophet in Israel. 
Notice Elisha's motivation here. Jehoram, you might not know that there's a prophet in Israel, but Naaman's going to find out. You might think that the God of Israel is sleeping or dead, but he's certainly not. There is a prophet in Israel. God is doing something in your time, and Naaman is going to know about it. So Naaman comes, you know, comes with his whole caravan of riches up to this poor prophet's door. I kind of picture Elijah living in some kind of a shack. Naaman's got all these riches, this pomp and circumstance, this royal procession. Knocks on the door. And Elisha, see this? Verse 10. Elisha doesn't even get up. Elisha doesn't even rise up out of his chair. He sends a servant. He sends a messenger to the door. Elisha sent a messenger to him and said, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. And we think at this point, you know, the stupidity of the king of Israel has been overcome. Naaman's finally going to be cured of his leprosy, but opposition arises again. This time from inside Naaman. See his response to the cure? But Naaman was angry. Naaman was angry. And he went away saying, he's angry for two reasons. First, behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me. How dare he ignore my royal procession and stay in his chair and send a messenger? But he's not just angry about Elisha not standing up. He's angry about the method that Elisha prescribed for him to be healed. He said, I thought he'd come out to me and stand and call upon the name of Yahweh his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not the Abana, the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. The solution that Elisha gives is basically a, a complicated bath. Right? It's just uh, intricate instructions for going. And taking a bath. And that's not what Naaman wanted, is it? He wanted something miraculous. He wanted something fantastic. Something spontaneous. Something instantaneous. Something divine. Surely Naaman had tried taking a bath before. And surely the rivers of Damascus were better, cleaner than the waters of the Jordan. So he's not happy with the solution that Elisha gives to his problem. And maybe we, could just, maybe we could just pause right here, jump out of the story into our own day. I think oftentimes when we've got problems, when we're struggling with a certain sin or we're being sinned against in a certain way, when we need healing or cleansing, we want something big. Something fantastic. We cry out to God hoping that he'll wipe the situation away, wave his hand, cure the leper. But all too often we're not willing to engage in the normal means of cleansing that the Lord has clearly provided to us. Confess your sin to a brother. and He might pray for you. Seek the Lord diligently in prayer. Meditate on his word day and night. Don't forsake gathering together and encouraging one another towards love and good deeds. The Lord has told us what cleansing looks like in our lives. Normal means of grace. So if that's you today and you're crying out to the Lord don't get weary of reading your Bible and praying. Don't stop coming to church. Keep confessing your sin, telling your friends, bearing one another's burdens. These things are not miraculous by our standards. But the Lord might just have 
big plans. In fact, I would argue he certainly does. That's how he transforms us. That's how he changes us. So don't lose heart. Don't give up. Keep going one step, one day at a time. Naaman turns away in a rage. But then we find more servants. His servants, I love his servants, their, their demeanor, their tone. You see what they do? His servants, they, they come near to him. And they say, my father. This isn't, a, this isn't a slap in the face. This isn't a stern rebuke. They draw near as sons to fathers and they say, my father. It's a great word. The prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? His servants just draw near tenderly, compassionately, and just remind him of the prophet's words. Just, isn't it worth a shot? Name it. Shouldn't you at least give it a try? What other options do you have? So he gives in. He went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, according to the word of the man of God. And what happens? The problem to our story is solved, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a child, and he was clean. Glory, hallelujah. But there's a deeper cleansing going on here. There's a, there's a deeper transformation. He returns to the man of God. Let's just notice, he didn't have to do that. Naaman could have gone on his way. His problem was solved. But there was something bigger going on. The purpose that Elisha set out to accomplish was being accomplished. So he returns. That word for return is the same word as repent. He returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. You just remember the idea of national deities? What's he saying here? My God's fake. Yours is the real one. He's been converted. He's been transformed. And he offers now a present as a token of his servitude to Elisha and the one that Elisha serves, the God of Israel. But Elisha says, as the Lord lives, before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Remember why Elisha called Naaman in the first place. That Naaman might know that there's a prophet in Israel. God's not dead. God's not sleeping. He's doing something. He's purifying his servants here and now. To accept any gift on top of that would just tarnish it. It would just ruin it. It would prove that Elisha was out for something other than the glory of the Lord, and he wasn't. He just wanted Naaman to know, and now Naaman knows. So Naaman picks up on this, and he makes a strange request, doesn't he? Okay, Naaman says, well, if you won't take something from me, give me something. Please give me Give to your servant two mule loads of earth. For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any God, but to Yahweh, the God of Israel. Naaman knows that the God of Israel is the real one. And he's not going to worship anyone else. So what he asks for is some of Yahweh's dirt. He wants some of Yahweh's home turf because he's not going to offer to anyone else. So he's going to come into his house and dump two piles of dirt on the floor and then he's going to offer his sacrifices there so that everyone knows he's not a servant of anyone else, only the Lord, only the God of Israel. Naaman's all in. But he foresees a problem. He says... In this matter, may the Lord, Yahweh, pardon your servant. When my master, Naaman's still a servant of the king of Syria. When my master goes into the house of Ramon, the god of Syria, to worship there. And he'll be leaning on my arm. And I bow myself in the house of Ramon. When I bow myself in the house of Ramon, the Lord pardon your servant. 
in this matter. Naaman says, it's going to look like I'm serving another God. But I will not. I'm only being a good servant to my earthly master. So would the Lord pardon me in this? Just love Elisha's response. Go in peace, he says. Story's over. Beautiful ending. But not. Here's the twist. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, See, my master has spared this Naaman the Syrian in not accepting from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, same words that Elisha said when he refused to take the gift, as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. The story is not about the leprosy on Naaman's skin. It's not about an unclean Syrian general. It's about uncleanness in the ranks of Elisha's servants. There's dry rot happening in the hearts of God's prophets. And the Lord designs this real life parable to draw out the leprosy in the hearts of his servants. Gehazi is not content that the glory of the Lord be shown forth in Naaman's life. Rather, he wants to get something. So Gehazi followed Naaman. When Naaman saw someone running after him, good old Naaman, good-hearted Naaman, he gets down from the chariot and said, is all well? And Gehazi says, all is well. My master has sent me, bold-faced lie, bold-faced lie. My master sent me to say, there have just now come to me from the hill country of Ephraim two young men, the sons of the prophets. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. Naaman is going to double down, doubly generous. He wants to serve the Lord. He says, please be, be pleased to accept two talents. And he urged him and tied up two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothing and laid them on two of his servants. And they carried them before Gehazi. But now Gehazi's got a problem. He's got the thing that Elisha refused. So when he gets up to the top of the hill where Elisha could see him, he takes the bags, goes and puts them in the house. He hides, sends Naaman's servants away. And he went in and he stood before his master And Elisha said to him, Elisha said to him, where have you been, Gehazi? Doesn't it sound like the Lord in the garden after Adam and Eve sinned, hide themselves in the fig leaves? Where are you? Elisha knows where he's been. He's giving him an opportunity. He's giving him an opportunity to be like Naaman and bring his leprosy out into the light. And I just wonder if maybe some of us here need to hear this this same question. Where have you been? What have you been doing? Maybe your relationship with the Lord is emotions, dry. Maybe you've got secrets. Maybe you're hiding. Maybe there's a lot of darkness. You come here this morning, and maybe the Lord says, where have you been? Come on out. Don't be like Gehazi this morning. Because his response is 
simultaneously one of the saddest and one of the funniest in the whole Bible. It's so childish. It's so weak. It's so lame. Where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, your servant went nowhere. <laughs> nowhere. Elisha said to him, did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male servants and female servants? Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, a leper like snow. The leprosy of Naaman is transferred to the real outsider. The one who's really unclean. Gehazi. Gehazi's leprosy is brought from the inside out so that everyone would know where his heart is. And that is how the story ends. Harsh. Sober ending. Because the story is about God's servants. Remember our main point. God is purifying his servants. So here are three statements, three points about God's purifying work that we must believe and obey in order to be faithful servants ourselves. First, God is using ignorant servants. So trust completely. Look at Psalm 119, 91. I love this. I love this. All things are your servants. In this text, we meet many servants who do the Lord's bidding without knowing it at all. Naaman at the beginning has been used by the Lord to win victories for Syria. The little girl, she grew up in this spiritually impoverished country. All the idolatry going on around her and yet the Lord uses her to say, maybe you should go to the prophet of God. Naaman's servants. Servants of Ramon, the deity of Syria. Remind Naaman of the prophet's words so that he might not go away angry and unclean, but converted, clean. All over there are servants who don't know what they're doing. By name, they are not servants of the Lord, but all things are your servants. If only, if only we would dare to believe that in our lives. You know the challenges in your marriage? really difficult child that you have? You know that, that boss at work? You know the mental health struggles you've been having? You know the physical health struggles you've been having? The church conflict? The weather? All things are your servants. I was reminded of this this morning. This is silly, but I hope this lands in unreal life a little bit. Just feeling restless this morning, trying to just striving to enter into the Lord's rest as I deliver the word to you. And I'm out sitting on our little, uh, the little playground out there, just breathing in the air, and I see this, this wasp come down onto a wood chip, and it's beautiful. I mean, it's just like. It's got red, and the, the yellow on it is like this fluorescent kind of yellow, and it's like hunting a bug that's there. And it's this just incredible story that plays out and just brings me outside of myself and reminds me that like what's going on in my head is, is so much smaller than what the Lord's actually doing in, in real life all around me. I'm just a little wasp. All things are your servants. The Lord just made this little story right in front of me to just bring me out, calm my nerves. What if, what if everything 
serve the Lord and those who serve him. Would you dare to believe it this morning? All things are his servants. So, so trust completely. Second, God creates unlikely servants. No one was farther from the Lord than Naaman. There was nobody more distant than him. And yet, God transforms him into a faithful servant of Elisha and, and the Lord. So, two different applications. If you're an unbeliever this morning and you're thinking, I don't know if God can purify me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know how hard this all is for me. Amen. God's work is for you. There's no one too unlikely for the grace of God. About a thousand years after this story happened, another prophet shows up. And he references this story. He goes to his hometown and says this. There were many lepers in, the time of, in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them was cleansed but only Naaman the Syrian. The Israelites may have been tempted to believe that this kind of a story where an outsider gets brought in was kind of an anomaly. Kind of didn't fit with God's character. Kind of happened sometimes but wasn't normal. But when God shows up, Jesus of Nazareth, he says, this is what it's all about. This is what I'm like. I did not come for people who think they deserve it. I came for people who never thought they could deserve it. I came for the most unlikely of you. And if you don't consider yourself unlikely, I didn't come for you. So you, unbeliever this morning, who's never come to Jesus before, you're not outside of God's grace. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God by many mighty works and wonders and signs. He's risen. And you can rise too. For believers here, you know that person who thinks they're a Christian and you just don't even know how to share the gospel with them because... <laughs> they'll think it applies to them. But you know from their life it doesn't. You just don't know how it's going to work. <clears throat> Keep serving. The gospel of Jesus is real and powerful and God is transforming people like that. You know the person who's just openly hostile to Christianity in your workplace? Who just mocks it? Who just won't even consider it? Totally discounts it? The grace of God is for them, so continue to serve the Lord and serve expectantly because God is purifying his servants. There's a work being done in our day, in our time. So keep serving expectantly because God creates unlikely servants. And last but not least, last but certainly not least, how the story ends, God judges unclean servants. So examine your heart. Friends, it's my, it's my conviction that this story lands on us much differently today than it would have landed on God's people then. Because we know that none of us is different than Gehazi. Do we not? No one has escaped that kind of entitlement and greed, selfishness, pride. But for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus, we do not need to fear the leprosy of Naaman clinging to us because it clung to Christ. And God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death. So we've been crucified with Christ. We do not need to fear the leprosy of Naaman, and yet God is cleansing us now. We've been crucified with Christ, but we have a thousand little deaths to die as he makes us more and more 
like his son as we move deeper and deeper into Jesus. I can't help but think of the servants who came to Jesus and said, look at all we've done. He said, I never knew you. So do you hear the Spirit speaking to you this morning? Do not ignore it. Move more deeply into the knowledge of Jesus like Paul. Count all things as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you sent your son because we're all like Gehazi. Even those of us who have experienced deep and real grace are so tempted to go get something. So I pray that the gospel would be real to us today. The cleansing we experienced in Jesus for those of us who are believers would be brought back to our minds and refreshed in new confession and repentance and forgiveness. I pray for those who have not yet met Jesus that the opportunity to come to the prophet be cleansed be so real for them. I pray these things in Jesus' name.